Hello everyone and welcome to today's Bible study. We are in 2 Kings chapter 8. So a lot has happened previously. Elisha prophesied the end of the famine in Samaria and Jeraham's right hand man didn't believe it so um, Elisha told him okay well you're going to see but you're just not going to get the benefit of it then. And so um, the lepers were going to go and mercy to the Samar um, to the Syrians and then when they got there they found out that everyone had fled and so everyone just abandoned everything in their tents and so there was an abundance of food and wealth and so they went in they started looting then they felt bad <laughs> and then they went and told the Israelites and then into the stampede so Israel the famine ended in Israel they got their food and in the process um, Jeraham's right hand man saw the food, but gone trampled to death. Yikes. So he saw it, but didn't get to enjoy it, as was prophesied. So there you go, there's a quick overview of chapter seven. And now let's see what we have in chapter eight. Then spake Elisha unto the woman whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise, and go thou and thine household, and sojourn wherever thou canst sojourn, for the Lord hath called for a famine, and it shall also come upon the land seven years. And the woman arose, and did after the saying of the man of God, and she went with her household, and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. And it came to pass at the seven years' end, that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines, and she went forth to cry unto the king for her house and for her land. So this is going back to the woman who Elisha's son, Elisha raised from the dead. Okay, that did not make sense. This goes back to the woman whose son Elisha raised from the dead. Okay, and he warned her about a seven year famine. And he said, you need to flee. So she did for seven years, but when she came back, she cried out for the land. So she must have lost her land here. Okay. Um, and the king talked with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha hath done. And it came to pass, as he was telling the king how he had restored a dead body to life, that behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life cried to the king for her house and for her land. And Gehazi said, My lord, O king, this is the woman and this is her son whom Elisha restored to life. And when the king asked the woman, she told him. So the king appointed unto her a certain officer, saying, Restore all that was hers and all the fruits of the field since the day that she left the land even until now. Oh, wow. So the king had asked, King of Israel had asked Gehazi to tell him all the great things about Elisha. Now up to this point, he wasn't too fond of Elisha. In chapter six, he was blaming Elisha for the famine. <laughs> when it wasn't Elisha's fault, but he was really mad at him and he wanted to hunt him down and kill him. And now we've got a complete change of heart and he wants to know, okay, tell me all the great things that Elisha has done. And at that perfect, divine timing, the woman who lost everything was about to come into the king and so Gehazi was able to tell the king about this very woman whose son um, was restored back to life from Elisha. So divine timing here. So the woman was able to give a first-hand testimony of what Elisha did and then she was able to get back everything that she lost, which is amazing just browsing my notes here and it made a really interesting point. Obviously when I'm reading commentaries I don't ever take it as gospel because it's just someone's opinion isn't it but I like um, what he said here. It's, it's this commentary saying okay what's Gehazi doing back here? We know that he um, stole from the king of Syria um, and he misled him into taking some silver and money from him basically because Elisha wouldn't accept the gift for what he did and restoring his leprosy. So we're like, wait, what's Gehazi doing back here? <laughs> like, what's going on? And this uh, this commentary has said, it's possible, what if Gehazi was one of the lepers? Because obviously he now had leprosy as a punishment for his sin. And so what if he was one of the lepers who was in the camp and then went and told Israel about it? 
so from he knew because they obviously they had about consciousness here saying oh we shouldn't really have done this we know that um you reap what you sow <laughs> and maybe he, he stopped and thought oh, actually i know firsthand what happens when you do things that you shouldn't do uh, so it's it's possible we don't know for sure obviously so i, I wouldn't like to say but it's an interesting idea that um that would make sense right Mm. And again, that would be God's divine working, because they um, they were enjoying the looting before they had a change of heart, saying, "Oh no, we shouldn't really do this." Mm. Just thought I'd add that in there as a possible theory. And Elisha came to Damascus, and Ben Hadad, the king of Syria, was sick, and it was told him, saying, "The man of God has come hither." And the king said unto Hazael, Take a present in thine hand, and go and meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? He's gone to visit the king of Syria now. By the way, I have noticed in previous ones, I, I sometimes use Aram, and sometimes use Syria, and I think that might get confusing. They are the same. Sometimes I say Aram because um, my commentary uses the CSB version, which uses Aram or Arameans, and the KJV uses Syria. Uh, but it is the same, it's the same thing, so if you ever get confused, <laughs> I apologise, I'll try and be consistent, but it does mean the same. Right, so he's rocked up to the king of Syria now, and then we know that they are old enemies of Israel. So let's just make a note of that. But, obviously, the king of Syria respected what Elisha was doing and he asked someone to take a gift to him and maybe help him out. So that's interesting. So Hazael went to meet him and took a present with him, even of every good thing of Damascus, forty camels burden, and came and stood before him and said, Thy son Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, hath sent me to thee, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? And Elisha said unto him, Go say unto him, Thou mayest certainly recover, howbeit the Lord hath shown me that he shall surely die. Ooh. And he settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. And Hazael said, Why weepest thou? Why weepest, my lord? And he answered, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. The strongholds wilt thou set on fire, and their young men will they, will thou slay with the sword, and will dash their children, and rip up their women with child. <gasps> and Hazael said, But what is thy servant, a dog, that he would do this great thing? And Elisha answered, The Lord hath showed me that thou shalt be king over Syria. And he departed from Elisha, and came, unto, came to his master, who said to him, What said Elisha to thee? And he answered, He told me that thou shouldst surely recover. And it came to pass on the morrow that he took a thick cloth, oh, dipped it in water, and spread it on his face, so that he died. And his hail reigned in his stead. You know, Hollywood have done movies about these storylines. There are so many storylines here that I'm reading so far that I'm like, pretty sure I've seen a movie about that. It's like they're mocking it almost, isn't it? Like, but it's crazy, right? Oh, okay, so so much happened here. So Elisha's answer seems confusing because it says, yeah, you're going to recover, but you're going to die. Um, and obviously, as we just read, we know why. But it was revealed because he started crying about what would happen. So... He started crying because he saw that Hazael is going to become the new king and he's going to slaughter Israel's people. And it's interesting that he said um, something about being, yeah, is thy servant a dog that he should do this great thing? And that made me think, it's like, does he even, even he might think, I would never do something like that. Like, it's interesting, isn't it, that he's like, what? Who would do such a horrible thing? And then it turns out he did it. it makes me wonder. Like, there are other times that you think, oh, I would never do anything like that, and then you surprise yourself in the worst way. Um, what is that? Is that is that evil coming over us? Is that temptation? What is it? It's strange, isn't it? It's an interesting concept that, you know, you might look at something and go, I would never do that. I, 
it just made me think. That's not in my commentary or anything, so I don't have any support on this statement. So if you've got your thoughts on that, let me know. That's just something that popped out at me, that even he was surprised that he ended up doing it. It's just interesting. And in the fifth year of Jeraham, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, being that king of Judah, Je Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, began to reign. Thirty and two years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as did the house of Ahab, for the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. So we've got a bad king. Shocker. Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for David his servant's sake. Oh, I think it's time to highlight again. I haven't highlighted in ages. But I like that, as he promised him to give him all the way a light and to his children. Uh, so hi, if you're new here, I highlight um, in a weird way <laughs> with tape because um, self-certified neat freak. That does that bother me that it's not going over the edge? Yes, it does. That's how much of a neat freak I am. In fact, I am going to refill that. So yeah, that's the reason why you probably don't see me highlighting often, because I save it for real important quotes that stand out. Okay, so, um, the Lord said he would not destroy Judah for David's sake. So, the whole point up to this point, we've been in a different storyline, and now we are shif shifting to Judah in the south of Israel. We haven't been in that story for a, I don't think, been at all in Second Kings so far. So, um, the king of Judah so far was Jeraham, who was Jehoshaphat's son. But he was evil in the sight of the Lord because his wife was Ahab's daughter and Ahab was the worst king in Israel. So, let me see if I can summarise some things. So now, unfortunately, we've got Ahab's legacy going not just through Israel, but now it's going through Judah as well. But fortunately, God's faithfulness is going to save Judah. <laughs> um, even though they are going down the wrong path. And obviously, God has made a promise to David and to always have a king rule on his throne forever, and that forever will be with Jesus soon. In his days, Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah and made a king over themselves. So Joram went over to Zer and all the chariots with him, and he rose by night and smote the Edomites which compassed him about, and the captains of the chariots and the people fled into their tents. So Jeraham is now having to deal with um, Edom's revolt. So Edom has been reigning for eight years, but he couldn't get them under control. And the rest of the acts of Joram and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Joram slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, and Ahaziah his son reigned in his stead. In the twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, did Ahaziah the son of Jeraham, king of Judah, begin to reign. Two and twenty years old were Ahaziah, oh very young, and he began to reign, when he began to reign, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Athalia, Athalia, that's a nice name, the daughter of Omri, king of Israel. And he walked in the way of the house of Ahab, uh -oh, and did evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, as did the house of Ahab, for he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. And he went with Joram, the son of Ahab, to the war against Hazael, king of Syria, in Ramoth Gilead. And the Syrians wounded Joram. And King Joram went back to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him at Ramah when he fought against Hazael king of Syria. And Ahaziah the son of Jeraham king of Judah went down to see Joram the son of Ahab in Jezreel because he was sick. Right, so Jeraham then was succeeded by his son Ahaziah. But he was just as bad, unfortunately. But he came, because he came under the influence of Athalia, and although Athalia has a nice name, she is Ahab's daughter, so nice name, not such a nice person. And so Ahaziah joined with Joram, 
who was the king of the north, they, they joined together to fight against King Hazael of Syria. But Joram was wounded and went to Jezreel. And then Ahaziah went to visit him. All right, so. Okay, all right, so we'll leave it there. So he's on his way to see the other king who they were teamed up with. So Ahaziah went down to see Joram and we'll see what happens tomorrow when he goes to see him. Uh, so yeah, interesting chapter. So a lot happened. We've gone through like quite a few years in one chapter. Things move quickly and a lot of evil still around, unfortunately. Um, yes. So please leave any takeaways and thoughts you have on this chapter and I will get back to you and God willing I'll speak to you tomorrow for chapter 9. I hope you've enjoyed this, have a lovely day and I'll speak to you soon. Bye!